my many hats are Trail of Cthulhu for uh, uh, Pelgrim Press, uh, The Day After Ragnarok from Atomic Overmind, uh, GURPS Horror, and many other fine GURPS from Steve Jackson, uh, GURPS works from Steve Jackson Games, Knights Black Agents, Jason Bourne vs. Dracula, and the Gumshoe System also from Pelgrim, and my magnum opus that myself and poor Gareth Hanrahan, who knew not what he did when he said, oh sure, I'd love to help, um, put together the Dracula dossier, which comes at, in the Dracula Unredacted and the Director's Handbook. Those are the lovely collector's editions, a premium, I'm sure. Is that what we're giving away? Is that, oh, lucky people. And the print. And the print, okay. And a framed print, look how pretty you've made it. You're so great, Brian. And then, um, uh, obviously, there are slightly less collectible, but still collectible in your heart, uh, versions of it for sale here at the store. Um, I guess what I'm going to do real briefly, Will has talked about how you make a setting sort of come alive and how you can add details to it and bring pieces of it out iteratively. And I'm going to talk a little bit, just a little bit, about how you build it up from the ground up. And I think when Will and I are both out here, we're just going to talk about how to GM. So if people have... I don't know what it is you crazy people do. I just wandered in to get magic cards and I'm trapped. <laughs> we'll address that later. Um, uh, but in terms of world building, you can use these sorts of ideas, not just if you're building a, a, a world for your game to be in, but if you're writing a novel, you're writing a story, a comic book, a video, short subject, I don't know, whatever. Um, because story and setting are sort of fundamentals, they stick across all media. And obviously, people can break rules and, and do really well, but that's why we have rules, is so you know that when you're breaking them, you risk being hit by traffic. Um, setting is the place that story happens, right? That's what it is, that's that part of fiction. So for it to be a place that story happens, it has to have something that story is made of, which is to say conflict. Uh, a, a beautiful, peaceful utopia where no one has any problems and all of your wants are solved instantly is not where story happens. Story happens on the edges of that when Klingons or um, uh, whatever are coming after your beautiful, peaceful utopia. Or savages who have not yet learned that you know you can get anything you want by asking the computer. And are they resisting? Are they rebelling? Are they good guys? Are they bad guys? Now we have a story because we have conflict. We have a question. That's an internal conflict, but an external conflict obviously is Mighty Space Armada's meet. They blow each other up. That's conflict. Conflict is what drives story. So your setting has to be a place where conflict happens. And more than that, more than that place axis, it also has to be a time when conflict happens. Right? The classic Western. you got the town. It's out in the middle of nowhere. There's bad guys, owl hoots, bandits, someone. Uh, 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 Liberty Balance is molesting the town. The story takes place at the moment when there is a gunfight and the bad guy goes down or the good guy goes down. It doesn't take place 10 years later when everyone says, man, remember that gunfight? That was awesome. Well, back to prosperous towning. And it <laughs> may not happen before then when it's just Liberty Balance rolls in and there's no one to stand up to him. And he just sort of rampages all over the town. Like, that's interesting, that's important, that's what we need to know. The future is what we're fighting for, it's the reason we have this fight, but the story is taking place at that time. So your setting has two axes already. It's got uh, place and time. And where those meet, those have to be where the conflict is. And so many people make this mistake. They're like, oh, this is a world after the fall of the Great Empire, when the elves are just beginning to come out of the forest again. It's like, is there a good reason we're not setting it during the fall of the Great Empire? Because that seems more story-ish to me. And it's like, what's the conflict? Are people hate the elves? No, they're happy to see the elves. The elves are great. Are the elves bringing some new wisdom? No, nope, they're bringing the old wisdom from the Empire. Why are we not back here where your story was? Why did I just read back story, literally? It's story in back of this. Which is not so bad if there's front story, but you didn't put it in the front, you put it way in the back. That seems odd to me. <laughs> so if, if you're doing that, ask yourself, when is the story? Where is the story? If the story is there's a mighty uh, war going on in the seas, and we're going to do the stories of the guys on shore. Okay? I can see there being stories here. They're like rescuing uh, drowned sailors. They're looting uh, cargoes. They're selling guns to both sides. No, 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 no. They're um, exploring the mountains and digging a copper mine. So that they can sell copper to the ships. Yeah, yeah, eventually. 
I think we want to be closer to the sea where the war is. I think that's maybe where story is happening. And so many people make this mistake, and it just boggles my mind. People who are paid much better than all of us put together to come up with stories do this. It's like, okay, he's an immortal, and he can he has all these great superpowers, and he has to hide out and, and walk among men. So the story is how he hides out and walks among men. No, the story is when he loses those powers and becomes just like us. No. <laughs> now you've, you've just missed the story. You've literally just missed it. You know, that might be interesting. That's an interesting character moment. But the story was what was happening before. And so you have to know when your story is and what it's going to be out. And so your characters, as we are beginning to allude to, have to be the people who are walking into that horrible nexus of place and time. So they're not the guys who are like, man, I hope I never have to go in that dungeon. That's awful. That everyone who's gone in there has been eaten by a Gru or something. I, I guess it was a Gru. It sounded Gruish, but I'm over here. <laughs> Don't roll that guy up. <laughs> I'm playing my character. He's not going to want to go anywhere near there. Yeah, I know that. Play the guy who's going in, because that's where story is. Don't play the guy in the copper mine. Play the sailors out in the pirate ships. Go, go play the... Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the guy who's back in Chicago and reads about the bandit wars out in the West, oh, play the marshal, play the school marm who has to uh, show down the bandit or else no one will get educated and there will be no town, right? You know, play someone who's there. Play someone who's walking into danger. And that is, you know, normally uh, the author will at least write a character who somehow is present. <laughs> I, I, again, I haven't read everything and I voluntarily don't read things that seem like they're not doing any of that. But if you are rolling up a character, and it's like, we're playing Traveler, it's the game of the far future, and you fly around in your merchant ships, and you trade for Quilithium, and you fight off Jodani, what are you going to play? Well, I'm going to play a noble. I'm staying back on Trantor. I'm not ever leaving. That's very dangerous. You can die in character creation. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, I, I know that. That's why we're here, not on freaking Trantor. Like Traveler and die in character creation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So... When you're making a character, you're making a story, there's always a guy. There's always a Scooby, right? You know, it's like, we're going to we're gonna design guys who go and solve mysteries. What are you playing? A giant talking dog. <laughs> Why? <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but this is a horror game with a giant talking dog. No. <laughs> Don't do that. We're all samurai. I want to be a ninja. No. <laughs> we're all samurai. And if, you know, if that's the guy who always buys pizza, maybe you let him be an engine. <laughs> but that, that's the buy-in, as far as I'm concerned. Eat the pizza to be an engine. Be part of the story, right? Be where story is happening. Be someone who's what the story is about. And again, ninjas are awesome. Everyone's a ninja. That's fine. That's fun. You guys are like the covert <coughs> Italian move ahead. The samurais ever see you, they will chop you in half. Uh, that's cool. But... One guy whose story is over here and four guys whose story is over here, you're already begging for trouble. You're already breaking story because you have to say, why are you walking out in the middle with all these samurais? Like, I don't know, you made me? <laughs> <laughs> Samurai, why are you trusting this ninja? He's not noble, he's awful. He's a terrible human being. He's learned to throw things at you and blind you. Yeah, you make a good point. I chop him in half. You know, that's... <laughs> right there is conflict. You've already... Well, then, yeah, it's a short conflict. <laughs> it's an inner conflict. We don't have dice for that. And you can tell that story, but how long can you tell that story? Either, oh no, we've agreed that he's cool. Well great, start there. You ninja, tell me why they think you're cool. You samurai, tell me why you didn't kill him. Now we're starting, you're not a, you're not a ninja, you're a cross-trained samurai with rogue powers, move. <laughs> you're not samurai, you're ninjas who are very terrible at ninja. <laughs> And good at katana. I mean that that you know tell uh, make characters who can move into the story that the setting is about, right? Uh, I mean, as a novel, that's a terrific novel, right? You know, the the ninja who has to be among samurai. Great. You can't role play that. You certainly can't role play it every day, and you certainly can't role play it unless the other four people literally are not interested in role playing. You know, this is not Hollywood. We don't have to. Give Michael Douglas extra lines because he's Michael Douglas, right? I mean, the, the, if you saw the Ghost in the Darkness, right? The movie about the uh, the hunting of those awesome lions that killed all those guys in Kenya, and Michael Douglas is like, "I'll be in your movie, William Goldman." He's like, "Great, Michael Douglas, now I'll get my movie made." Oh, right, now the movie has to be about Michael Douglas, not about the guy who's hunting lions. It's Michael, like, hey, how's it going, I'm Michael Douglas? And you don't have to do that. Don't put up with that crap. Everyone's there to tell the same story. 
it's still a pretty good movie, but it gets really deformed by Michael Buckles. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not even as hard on him as other people. Um, so once you've got those three elements, the three classical elements, plot, character, story, happening in the same place, or as we call it, setting, then you can go, then you can move, then you can say, now what do I put in my setting? Now, what kind of pirate ships? What's the war about? Are there ninjas that are moving among us unseen, pretending to be badly drawn samurai? What's happening? Those sorts of stories are the things you can do as one-offs. You can do as bits, because you're telling what uh, Robin Laws, my confrere, likes to call a procedural story. You're telling a procedural story with iconic heroes. And iconic heroes uh, solve problems and move forward. Right? Batman does not change. Batman is always Batman. Batman stops the Joker, he stops the Penguin, he stops Catwoman, he stops Killer Croc, he stops uh, 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 Dr. Mr. Freeze, he stops the Riddler, he stops the Penguin again, he stops the Joker again. Batman, Batmans. Batman does not have to have a, a moment of angst. Why am I with the Justice League? You know, maybe you do that as one story or one arc, but that's not what Batman does. That, that's just nonsense. <coughs> Your characters, by and large, are going to be characters who are growing in power, but not necessarily changing and evolving as people. Now, there are plenty of games that have change and evolve as people mechanics. Uh, those are uh, usually, not always, uh, indie games, story games, which are about a constrained set of emotions and a constrained story arc, which is great. But you didn't have to design that. If you're playing Mountain Witch, you know what the story setting and everything else is because it's, it's in Mountain Witch. Mountain Witch only does one thing. It does it perfectly, but it only does one thing. If you're playing Joe Price's Contender about being a boxer, you already know what you're doing. You're the boxer, right? You rise, you fall. That's your, that's your story. That's always going to happen in Contender. But for the story, for the setting that I, the GM, am building, and there are, there are hybrids, right? Uh, in uh, Ash and the Stars and in Knights Black Agents, you've got personal arcs that your characters can go through. In um, the Apocalypse world stuff, character bonds and character conflict are part of what drives the action. Great. In GURPS, you know, uh, you have um, uh, a, a horrible greed, uh, so treasure will always drive you. Great. That's, that's, that's ways to hook yourself in the, in the setting, in the more or less. But you, the GM, you, the original creator of the setting, cannot assume that any of that is going to happen. What you have to have is a setting that will challenge and will drive the story by itself. You have to have a ticking clock that no matter whether the players know what they're doing or not, story happens. Because if the players can stop the story by sitting around and arguing, guess what? That will stop the story. Because they're going to do it. And so you need to have a setting where there is an ongoing conflict, where something will happen. Uh, I lazily like to steal from Massive Merlothotep and have uh, the countdown clock, where the villain has a plan, and whether you stop him, interfere with him, or even know what he's doing, he's going to be moving on his plan, whether you're there or not. And it's up to you to get to his plan and uh, gum it up. Other people do things with the setting. With that uh, pirate war thing, you could have, you say, well, I'm basing it on history. I know how the French and the English fleets are going to knock each other out of the Indian Ocean in history, and I know these nine things are going to happen. Or you may have a, a, a die roll. You're like, uh, roll one for England, one for France. France rolls six, England rolls two. France wins the battle. Now the story is moving forward. You've got everything you need, and the players are like, elves? Really? Yeah, yeah. It was elves. It was in Yakko, Washington, the fort. So the lumber guys brought in ninjas. Well, yeah, they're fighting elves, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Why are we in Yakima, Washington? I don't know. Why are you in Yakima, Washington? And you go around, you get everyone to buy in, you say, what's bringing you to Yakima? Why can't you be literally anywhere else in 1915? Are you dodging the draft? Are you um, uh, uh, out of work? Are you wanted for crimes you didn't commit in Portland? You know, what's, why are you in Yakima, Washington? Those guys are in Yakima, now they're in part of it. And they're like, oh, this is Yojimbo. And then they can tap the levers, and maybe you've got a, a, a time bomb in there. You know, maybe there's a, a, an arch druid who's buried underneath it, but once enough blood seeks into the soil, he wakes up, and now all hell breaks loose. Whatever, you, you can start riffing on stuff once you have a basic structure. And even having a basic structure works so many times that often you don't even need anything else. You need, uh, you need that. And so I would recommend, um, before you start, asking yourself those questions. Is there going to be a, a conflict? Can I get to a conflict? Will my players go to the conflict? 
forcing the answers to all those to be yes or changing your game until they are. And then Yojimbo or failing that, taking time off. All right, that in that was is a personal best for setting. I usually space this out over three or five seminars. Um, but I wanted to get that out of the way because in case anyone had questions or wanted to ask something besides what the hell is wrong with you. Um, you can ask that too, but we don't know. But science is baffled. Um, so that's building a setting, right? That's making a setting that, that has a story in it, which is the definition of setting. So if anyone's got any questions, this would be a great time to ask. Uh, I'm currently designing a rules-like game that doesn't really focus as much on setting as much as the action itself. Right. What would be a good way to replicate any sort of setting detail? Um, well, to cut the short story, it's a game about U.S. Special Forces operators. Right. Um, That's great. Like special for uh, like various secret operations uh, throughout history. Be because most of the world is already known to the players, but specific points might not be known, and most of the action is going to be combat, mission prep, and extraction. What would be a good way to sort of educate the feel of a, like a special forces secret ops sort of feel in small doses? I think what I would do with something like that, um, and this is different from how I would run the game versus how I'd write and market the game. If I'm running that game, your awesome special ops, pretty high tactical, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing, yeah. right? Yeah, very. If I'm doing something like that, what I'm going to do is I'll probably rent uh, Zero Dark Thirty, right? And the players will all watch it. And we'll it's be on like, my bookshelf, right? And we'll be like, "Oh, great, Zero Dark Thirty, awesome. Uh, that was fun. Now we sort of have a sense of what we're doing. We're not weighed down with a bunch of details. We sort of know what we're doing. We're in. We're ready to go. Ideally, you set it in Afghanistan as opposed to you know Congo because you trained them up for Afghanistan. But you know what I mean. In the book. What I would do is I would encourage the GM, obviously, to do a little reading or a little movie watching, and pick five, three to five salient details. And these can be details like, um, after about four in the afternoon, everyone who's been chewing cot all day wakes up and they are angry. That's just a thing we know. Uh, another detail, it smells like uh, frankincense. Right? Yemen smells like frankincense all the damn time. That's where it grows, right? It blows down off the hills, right? Um, another another detail. Um, your uh, you have a you have a, a flash suppressor on your gun, so you can snipe someone at night and they can't see the blast. And you give just five little things, and so they know that these little bits. The GM knows these little bits you want to put into the setting. And you might say um, uh, uh, the the militia's men in Yemen uh, drive around in white Toyota pickups with um, uh, fifty caliber machine guns welded in the back, but no one wears seatbelts, right? That's true. Yemen had a civil war over whether or not there would be mandatory seatbelt registration, and guess who won? <laughs> um, and so the, uh, and, and so the, uh, that's a little detail that you can know as a, as a GM, and you're like, oh, I feel really comfortable with this little detail. And obviously, someone who really wants to know about Yemen, that's why we're setting it in Yemen, not al Qadim Yemen. Yeah. Um, you can look up Yemen, you can read about Yemen, you can freaking go to Yemen if you want to. You can yemen yourself to death. Uh, but those five details will be enough to sort of, if you put them into the story, that will feel like Yemen, right? That'll be the, the, the evocative detail. And for those, uh, for the places you're likely to go as special forces operators, you know, Yemen, Colombia, Congo, wherever, just list those five things. List five smells, list, list five sights, list five um, uh, sensory impressions of some kind. Yeah, cultural specific things that you don't yeah. find in that part of the and world. And setting specific things. You know, what's it what's what's the weather like? Is it hot? How hot is it humid hot or dry hot? Is it you know, just little things that they wanna that they want to know that the GM can feel comfortable bringing out into the game. Yeah, thank you. Are there besides the obvious being boring, <clears throat> are there things that that you shouldn't do it with a setting? Well, um <clears throat> by and large a setting should not be solvable. Or it shouldn't be solvable fast. Assuming it's a setting that you want to keep. I mean, obviously, if the goal is I solve the problem in this town, I move to the next town, I'm going to solve this problem and move to the next town, then the towns are not your setting. The West is your setting, or Europe is your setting, or whatever. Um, but, it, but the setting should not be solvable unless your plan is we're playing a short, one and done, four session, six session game, which is great. If you're doing that, that's awesome. But the setting should fill the time allotted to your game. 
There should be no period of time where like, well, we did that, now what? That should not ever happen. If you do that, you do that between games over pizza or uh, on the uh, on, on IM. Like, well, it looks like we've pretty much um, uh, solved the problem of, uh, of Sri Lanka. What, are we gonna do anything now? No, all right, next game. Uh, so that's that, that's the thing that I think a, a, a setting should uh, should avoid. It should avoid being solvable. Yeah, we started the problem where we did get our samurai and ninjas in order. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a Star Wars game fall apart because we were all five different settings, but half the people were pulpy Jedi Star Wars, and half the people were gritty bounty hunter Star Wars, and we didn't know how to resolve that. How would you resolve it if you realized you've already gone into a game, everyone's ready for it, but half the table thinks in one genre and half the table thinks in another. Um, there's two ways to do that. Uh, there, one way is just switch up. This is Bounty Hunter Day. This is Jedi Day. This is Bounty Hunter Day. This is Jedi Day. Bounty Hunter, this is a problem that the Bounty Hunter is going to have to take point. And the Jedi will have to sort of hang back in their robes <coughs> and maybe occasionally do a Jedi mind trick, but they can't full on Jedi out. And then the next adventure is, nope, this is the one where you got to fly off walls and bounce around and do all kinds of things, and the bounty hunter's job is just to stand back and shoot people with their blaster and just switch it out. The other way is to think, all right, what is the average of those, right? You're three bounty hunters and your boss flighting around Jedi. You're like, okay, maybe, but the boss flighting around Jedi, they'll get off if we do lots of dogfights, right? Lots of TIE fighters zooming around. That'll be the same sort of feel, same adventure feel. And the gritty dudes, they won't mind so much if the rotten missions they're taking are for a guy who wants to reform the Jedi Order with this magical crystal or something, right? And so you put a little of the magic into the gritty guys and a little of the grit into the magic guys, and you try and sort of see if you can thread that needle. And if you can't make it work, if you can't get everyone sort of onto, if not the same page, at least the same two-page spread, then yeah, maybe it is time to say, guys, we have a problem. Half of you are playing one game, half of you are playing the other game. What do you think we should do? Right? Ask your players. That's not always a bad plan. Um, they're usually nice people. Often they're quite bright. And so you can say, you know, what do you, what do you think? Are you having fun uh, during the, the swoopy time, pretty guy? And he's like, yeah, I just check out. You know, it's cool. I'm, I'm always happy to see Carl, you know, jump around like a monkey. That's, that's awesome. Carl's great. And you say, Carl, are you having fun during gritty time? And he says, well, not really, but, you know, Monica really likes that, and I like Monica, so whatever. It's, it's fine with me. And so maybe they're cool with it. Maybe the only person having a problem is you. But if they're not cool with it, it's like, yeah, you know what? Screw those guys. Then you're like, okay, all right, obviously we can't do this. Is there something in Star Wars we can all agree on to play? Maybe we don't play any of that. Maybe we're playing um, uh, 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 guys who are recruited into the Empire and we have to realize that it's a terrible idea and we're rebelling against the Empire. Or maybe we're playing something else, some other <coughs> common, you know, everyone starts on the same page part of the story. Or maybe we're just doing pure picaresque. There's two Jedi and two bounty hunters and we're flying around in the Millennium Falcon and we're having whack adventures. And maybe that's the way we do it. And we just say, okay, everyone just be patient. Half these adventures are going to be Jedi, half these adventures are going to be bounty hunters. That's just the way the world is. So talk to your players. Maybe that's, you know, I, I hate to advise that because who knows where that could lead. But uh, we're all grown-ups, mostly. Um, I mean, not me, but on average. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Wouldn't another option with this thing be, since something like Star Wars is <clears throat> so established with, you know, the public, dark era, the new empire and all that, especially with the new crap that just came out back in December, couldn't you just say, like, Hey, bounty hunters fit here, so we're not running bounty hunters in OVR, or Jedi, you're more prominent here, so try to curb yourself to make characters fit. Well, so as, a, as, a, as a DM, well, that's basically you're telling tell a story, but the players can sometimes trip you up by one being so left and then one being so right, like it seems like you have. I mean, but, but that's basically what I just said, right? You yeah. either find a place where they both fit, or you say... We're going to switch, or can we find a place where we all agreed from the jump? Well, from right. the boring, like from the get go. Yeah, right, that's what I mean. Yeah. But he's he's postulating problems have already happened. <laughs> now, how do we go back in time and avoid problems? Well, we knew that. First, that's what thermal detonation <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Among other things. Also, detonating thermal things. They really work for that. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Will and I are going to do GMing uh, uh, once we do our dog and pony. So if you've got GMing questions,
questions, we're obviously I'm happy to answer them. But Will will also be answering them. So, yeah. When you're working on the setting, how do you know if you put in too much detail or too little detail? Like if I'm setting it for a new game. Mm -hmm. um, by and large, when you're bored, um, when you're bored, the players will definitely be bored. Now, the trick is, often, you're bored much later than the players are bored. So, uh, the way to know whether you've got too much detail is if you are putting too much of that iceberg above water. I mean, you can never know too much about your setting. If you're having fun, more power to you, right? Um, when I write a book, God knows, this Day After Ragnarok is, you know, 55,000 words, because the print is very small, this book is very little, there is a lot that is not in here, trust me. Um, and I know a lot about the world of 1948 now. But I iceberged it. Like, what's the shiny part of that iceberg? What's the thing that's really bananas? There was an FBI agent who was a spy and through, and his cover was he was a tennis pro. Oh, also, he was an anthropologist. Well, you can't not have that. <laughs> That's just too crazy. That's awesome. So he goes in, but I don't go into, what is the FBI doing in the rest of South America? I don't care. <laughs> do they have a tennis pro anthropologist? No, they do not, so sorry. So you put in the things that are the most shiny, the most deadly, the most sharp on the top. That's what you show the players. <coughs> And then you build as much of the bottom as you want to, right? But certainly if you're bored, stop. You know, no one is getting course credit for this shit. So just you know, stop when you're done. Um, this is a hobby, not a death march. Yeah. Is there a rule of thumb for, for scaling the difficulty of the encounter, that kind of thing? It depends on your rule set entirely. Um, obviously D&D has not just rules of thumb, books of thumb. <laughs> for, for, for scaling the difficulty of your encounter. Um, Call of Cthulhu simultaneously. Oh, all encounters are failed. Well, that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, as far as the setting, is there, is there a point where you, where you have to sit back and say, even though this is what the rules are telling me, this doesn't agree with my setting? Kind of well, that's just changing. You know, you're saying, oh, bugbears have eight dice, not nine dice, or whatever. Right? I mean, you're, you're just doing, you know, notes in the corner. Uh, if, 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 it, if you're not playing a game where um, realistic military tactics or realistic physics are important, then yeah, you want to you know dial it down so that five gaily comparison heroes and a cartoon dog can actually change the world. Um, but nine times out of ten, the game engine will tell you, right? You know, in, in uh, Knights Black Agents, you're a, you're a boss spy, so you can take out any number of moves. You have about the same number of other boss spies can oppose you, and vampires will rip your lungs out. So there that's the that's the metric for telling you know an encounter. And you should be able to guess that or not even guess that, reason it out based on what the numbers in the back of the book tell you. Um, what's your rule of thumb for making NPCs and setting? Uh I, I would say there's two rules of thumb right off the top of my head. Uh, one of them is they have to shine a light on the setting in some way. Right? If they're just an itinerant weirdo like the player characters, you really haven't learned anything. I mean, sure, settings attract itinerant weirdos. That's why you made them in the first place. But have a guy who's you know here because he really, really cares about the frankincense, right? He's uh, got the corner on frankincense, and that's why he's here. Have a guy who really illuminates something about the setting as an NPC so that when they talk to him in-game, he can provide them setting details without it being a vomited fourth exposition. Or, read this handout about Yemen. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> but instead, they're talking to the guy, and he's like, well, as you know, our tribe, the Houthi, have been kept from power for years. And it's like, oh, well, I did not know that. But yeah, of course I knew that. And so you can have that information that, that the uh, guy provides because he's tied into the setting. The other thing, obviously, that NPCs um, should be is interesting. If you're spending screen time on the guy, this is not the movies. You know, if, uh, if if Natalie Portman is playing a boring character, it, it, at least it's still Natalie Portman, right? You've got something to do. You can't do that in a game, right? You have to. Your guy has to put a, a story happening, or a, a shine a light, or do something interesting. And I'm not saying you know he has to you know juggle monkeys, but he has to provide a, a story hook. He has to give information or help or provide interesting opposition or 
be the guy who they know that when they shake him down, sure enough, the corrupt cops show up. Well, now he's a button that they can push to get a response. It may not be a good response, but they know they can get it. And they hit him a couple of times, and corrupt cops come and beat him up. And eventually they're like, what if we wanted the corrupt cops to go beat those guys up? Let's hit him and pretend it was those guys. Look at that. We've made a thing go. We've worked a machine. <laughs> And that is what NPCs do. They are levers. They, pro they provide plot. They provide clues. They provide role-playing moments. They provide personal story arcs. If it's like, no, this is about how I've learned to accept my ninjiness. You know, the guy's like, he used to be a ninja, but he lost his legs in the Great Frankincense War. And now he's just there, but he's dispensing ninja wisdom of all the kind of ninja things you can do from the waist up. Um, and so now he's a character. It's like, oh, I get it. How do you deal with the fact that you can't hide anymore? And he's like, well, it was tough. And so here's, you get a character moment out of that guy, as well as maybe, you know, a slight of hand skill and some more exploding frankincense. Um, whatever it is. So your character should be innately interesting. They should reveal something about the setting, and ideally they should have a function. And I think that they all have functions, but if you know them ahead of time, that will be faster than if you don't. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> right? All right. So okay, I think we're doing the door prize, right? Yeah, we can do the door prize. We get uh, uh, we are giving away uh, collectors editions, courtesy of uh, the fine folks at uh, Pilgrim Press. Uh, Simon and Cat uh, have sent us uh, collectors copies of the uh, Dracula dossier director's handbook and the dust cover edition of Dracula Unredacted and the and handsome print and, and the really nice framed print and we have some unframed prints back there also that we're okay. giving out as well. This is Dracula's mm -hmm. castle. Yep. <coughs> <laughs> and as uh, I've used that image before in my own way. Oh, good. Really? Uh, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> my name is in the book as an art director, but what that meant is I wrote and said, we should have a picture of Dracula's castle. Make that happen. And then Kat did all the part where she hired a writer. Do I recognize his name? George pointed out to me that I neglected to put up your edition. I knew we had another one of Ken's books for us. The Flame Princess. Quite awesome. I think, and I don't want to say for sure, I think it's Jeff Brown, but I may be wrong. So. Anyway, yeah, too long. That's oh, yeah. my lamentations. The Flame Princess, that is uh, Fantasy Cambodia, which is next door to, but worse than, Fantasy Vietnam. <laughs> uh, so anyway. Does it bear any uh, relation or similarity to uh, uh, David, David McGrogan's You'd Swim for Lamentations? I haven't read You'd Swim, so okay. if it does, it's coincidental. Okay. But if You'd Swim is awful, then yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I can't see it. Okay. Um, that, I that, think, that, that, that's all yeah. uh, I, I, I think Zach S. said that uh, Keelong could be a province of Yoon Swim when he did his review. So. Yeah. Anyway, um, with the lovely prints, it's framed and beautiful. And uh, uh, Kat, uh, when, when we were talking about it, she says, isn't that a little obvious? I mean, when you're <laughs> looking for Dracula's castle, do you say, oh, there's a giant Gothic thing up on top of the mountain. Maybe we could go there. And uh, we don't know. But anyway, it's lovely. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'll simply walk into Transylvania. Okay, so, so, we have the gigantic beach ball. What's your favorite setting that you've worked on? That I've worked on? Um, the Cthulhu Mythos, uh, which is cheating because obviously that spans all time and space. But within the Cthulhu Mythos, I'm super fond of uh, a little city that I invented called London. <laughs> the Counts of London, where you play guys who sell. Uh, uh, mythos tomes, and if you sell them to people who are actually going to use them to destroy the world, that would probably be a bad idea, so maybe you should tear out the diagrams or sell them a forgery, but if you get caught, well, that's really bad, and what if tearing out the diagram is dangerous? Oh, it probably was. Huh. And you can't not sell them because it's the Depression. you got to make rent. And of course, we all, all of these right books up here are, are part of the stories that we're planning for sale. Another thing I can say about the book I've done is one, it won multiple Emmy Awards. Uh, and in addition to Ken's fantastic writing, there's the most amazing collection of maps yeah. on that I've ever seen. Yes. Original 1930s yes. London, fully mapped. Suitable for any game you play that is not Trail of Cthulhu, but why? Why, I ask? <laughs> why? Yeah. 
I, I, had, I just had a, like, as a mirror to what you just answered, what is your favorite setting that you haven't worked on that you feel has informed how you deal with other settings in your entire career? Um, if you could put one setting... Well, I mean, I've one. never actually done a Western, right? I mean, I've done Deadlands Noir, which is set in Chicago, among other places, in the 1920s. I've done The Day After Ragnarok, which is very Western-y. I've done games that are very much informed by the Western as a narrative and as an ethos, but I've never straight up done a game set in the Old West. So that, I guess, would be my setting. Yeah. If Cthulhu GMing questions are open. Uh, sure. It's, it's the issue you get with some scenario books where there's a cool Cthulhu adventure. I'm not supposed to play with this. <laughs> and then suddenly, you want to add in a Dreamlands part. And some players will love it when the Dreamlands is mixed in with the Cthulhu, and other players, it's completely anathema. When do you think the Dreamlands best works to add into a generally straight Cthulhu? Well, uh, there are two answers to that. First, Dreamhounds of Paris by Robin Laws and myself is the Dreamland supplement for Trail of Cthulhu, in which you play the major artists of the Surrealist movement who discover that by your art you can alter the Dreamlands. And isn't that great? And then you discover that by altering the Dreamlands, you're altering the world, which is less great, because some of those alterations are having weird knock-on effects that you didn't expect. So that is the best way to play in the Dreamlands, because it's awesome. And Robin did a terrific job with it, and it is just mind-blowingly cool to get to say, oh, yeah, I'm playing Salvador Dali, and I'm playing René Magritte, and I'm playing, you know, uh, Jean Eloard, right, or Paul Eloard, and that's way neat. Um, also, I wrote the part on for Paris, which I think is pretty strong. Um, I would say that failing that, the best way to introduce it into standard Cthulhu is first you take the temperature of the room, right? You guess, all right, of my players, how many are going to react with delight to talking butterflies, and how many are going to fall off the chair laughing, and how many of them are going to say, Come on, man, I'm here for tentacles. And if you get a majority for talking butterflies, then, yeah, why not? Just knock it right out, get the Dreamland supplement that Sandy did, and have a blast. If you think people are really here for the horror, amp up the nightmare part of the Dreamlands, the weird little turban bastards that sneak in and try and kidnap you with blood rubies and all that awful crap and how, you know, you're always looking